welcome everybody um, and who's just joined us. If you'd like to put your camera on, we'd love to see uh, who's with us, if you feel comfortable. Um, we are uh, going to get started now. Uh, I'm joined by Malika Bilal, who I'll introduce properly in a few minutes. Uh, Mikey Mohanna, who many of you know, is also on the call. He, he, he will be managing the chat. Um, please, throughout the conversation, feel free to uh, message questions um, in the chat and we will get to them during the Q&A session. Uh, today, Malika will be joining us to tell us um, about uh, her experience and thoughts and things as somebody who uh, is in, not only in the public eye, but contributing to the conversations that we've all been having. Um, just a little introduction uh, to Malika. Malika is the host of The Take. It's an international news podcast from Al Jazeera. She's the former co-host of The Stream. A social media community with its own TV show on Al Jazeera English. Uh, Malika graduated from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where she studied journalism. She also attended the American University in Cairo uh, to develop her knowledge of Arabic. And as she told us, um, she left with, uh, with less knowledge of Fusha than she came in with, which is something I think a lot of us can um, uh, relate to. So uh, Malika, I would love to get started. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about, I'm not going to talk too much more about your bio because we're going to, I would like you to tell us a little bit more about that. But mm -hmm. I really want to start with, um, so welcome Malika. Um, Hi, Malika, thank you. Thanks for having me. We're so happy to have you. Malika has been a part of the Africa community for a long time. And I, uh, I'm just so happy that we have her with us today. Um, Malika, a couple of uh, weeks ago on Father's Day, you posted on your Instagram <laughs> a really sweet video of you doing a sound check with your dad. Um, and it looked like you were already a journalist at a young age. So I'd love for you to start by telling us how did we go from the little girl to uh, the journalist? So my dad was, he's been cleaning out the basement, which is kind of a, it's just like a crazy space where he keeps all of his old recordings, home videos, that kind of thing. Um, and so he's been digitizing them. And um, several months ago, he sent me that. And I never actually got around to looking at it because I'm thinking, oh, like unfortunate fashion choices. My glasses were bigger <laughs> than my face. Like I'm not going to watch that. And then shortly before Father's Day, I just happened to click it in my phone and and it made me realize something that I didn't know at the time and that I actually didn't have a recognition of all these years. So I have been in this storytelling zone since I was a little kid. And it just kind of is innate. It's not even a thing that I recognize. It's not a thing that I could have told you, oh, I became a journalist because, you know, from a very young age, um, I was primed to do this by my parents. So my father um, was also uh, is a filmmaker. He was in the same field, not necessarily a journalist, but um, he went around the world recording things, documenting things for video purposes. So that took him um, from Kashmir and he'd come back with these beautiful like Kashmiri wraps and shawls to Afghanistan. And this is during the time of the Soviets being there. So that was a really scary period when I was a little kid thinking of my, why is my dad going to Afghanistan um, to parts of Europe? And so that was ingrained in me that my dad was a storyteller and that my dad was someone who was in these arts. Um, but then at one point he launched this cable access channel. So um, he had his kids involved in that. And so I was giving <laughs> a book report and it was on one of my favorite books because I was a voracious reader. And uh, yeah, when I look back on it now, I don't know how I did it because I have a really bad memory, but mm -hmm. apparently I wrote that book report and I memorized it, internalized it, and then got on camera and told the world about it. And uh, unfortunately, we have the video to prove that it happened. <laughs> That's so, great. Yeah. I love that story. And do you, so from going from childhood to sort of when you went to college and started studying, what was, when did you decide that you wanted to, to pursue journalism and what was that? you know, experience of doing it as an academic pursuit and then transitioning into professional work? I kind of fell into it, um, which is not something I think people expect to hear. They, they expect, oh, you know, you have a passion for something and you go after it. And for me, it was more like I did it in school. I did it in high school. I did it in college. And I always had professors or teachers tell me, oh, you're really good at this. Like, this is a thing that you should pursue. And so for lack of another option, I decided, all right, let me, let me try out journalism. So, um, 
majored in it in college, went to a specific school that was a journalism school. And mm-hmm. um, from there, it was easy because there it was getting a taste of all the little facets of the industry. So I started out in print and I learned a little bit about TV production, but I decided that TV production was probably not going to be for me because everyone on campus that was in the broadcast major, they had a certain look. Um, and if you watch news in the United States, of course, this isn't as true for other parts of the world, though though similar, there's a look that people have that are on TV and they all kind of look the same. There's variations of it, but it's, it, there's a mold and there's a model. Your hair is perfectly quaffed. You always have on makeup. Um, you're the, a perfect size. You're wearing certain clothes. And you also speak in a certain way. Um, and I just, it felt so uniform and it also felt not like me. And so... Um, I almost self-censored myself from entering it. I knew that there was no way that I was going to be able to fit that mold. And so Mm -hmm. why try? Um, And I went into print instead, Um, decided I would work at a newspaper somewhere after school. Like my, my dream was to work at the Chicago Tribune because that was in my hometown and from Chicago. And it seemed like a glamorous job that I could wear heels to and go to downtown Chicago and perch on a desk and assign people stories like that. That was the dream. Um, and then graduation hit and I couldn't find a job. There was nothing. So this is right before the recession. Yeah. And I'm freaking out because I'm thinking I have spent so much of my parents' money on this fancy education that has resulted in absolutely nothing. Like, what did I do? I should have become a doctor because at least then I would have a clear career path laid out for me. I know what comes after school, then there's med school, and then there's a high paying job. Um, that, that was what I was thinking about. And so long story short, um, I applied to whatever I could get. And the only thing I could get was a fellowship um, at the Voice of America, which is VOA. It's here in DC. It's Some would call it propaganda, (laughs) others would just call it government (laughs) radio. So it was formed during the Cold War as a way for the U.S. to get its message out to the rest of the world. And you actually can't listen to it in the United States. And so that's where I found myself after college. Um, And actually, I I look at it as a complete um, wonderful thing that happened because it introduced me to the world of international news. That's so interesting, too, that like your first kind of gig was in based in the United States, but to an audience outside of the United States. And then the next phase of your career is really with Al Jazeera, which you can tell us a little bit more about kind of how you started at the Twitter desk and how uh, that grew into your role on the stream, which is, I think, what most people know you from. And that's a show that, you know, kind of blew up. I mean, with Al Jazeera, they kind of grew together. And that I think Al Jazeera is a good example of a news media organization that sort of changed where news was coming from and who the audiences were um, even, and you can, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you guys did that on the stream. We can, I, actually the stream is another question I have, but go on and tell us a little bit about Al Jazeera and that phase uh, in okay. Doha, which is where we met each other for the first time. Yeah. Um, so I had studied abroad in Egypt um, during my undergrad and I had a friend who um, at AUC and after AUC, he had, you know, worked for a little bit in the Middle East and Egypt, and then joined Al Jazeera, which had launched a year before I graduated college. Um, And so a year into it, he messages me and I'm at Voice of America, kind of hating my life in in the middle of a a quarter life crisis, thinking this isn't what I want to do with my life. I don't know what I want to do with my life, but I know this isn't it. Um, But yet I'm, I'm thankful that I have a job and I'm thankful that it's given me the skills it's given me, but what's next? And so he messages me out of the blue and is like, Malika, you would love Al Jazeera. You need to apply for this place. This is, this is for you. And I'm thinking he's right. This is exactly what I want. Um, But it's also in, you know, it's in a place that I've never been to. Um, The furthest out I had been was Egypt. And so had never been to the Gulf, knew Mm. nothing about it, um, but applied anyway, got the job. And then if anyone knows how things work in the Gulf and the Middle East, you know, it took maybe half a year before I actually got the job just because of paperwork (laughs) and bureaucracy. So um, finally made it out there, joined the online desk as a reporter and a producer, and then 
stuff started happening, stuff started rumbling. And so it started with Iran um, and the, the revolution, the green revolution, they were calling it. And so people out in the streets. And then that is when we decided, you know, Twitter is a big deal. And Twitter is where a lot of news is breaking. And the best people to tell that story were the people who were on the web desk, which is where I were, was yeah. because we were using Twitter, we were using these tools, and we were seeing what people were saying in real time. And I always found it, I mean, the stream for me is so fascinating because it was really probably the first, you can correct me if there was something else, but I think it's the first sort of news program that engaged seriously with social media and Twitter specifically. And, you know, watching that over the years with you co-hosting, you you tackle so many topics. What was really interesting to me is like, it wasn't a news desk where you're saying exactly what's happening in that minute, but it was very, it was within the the week's news but it was like a long format discussion conversation with a lot of different perspectives. And I think something that I'm wondering about is, and Mikey just asked a question in the chat, which I wanted to bring up about how do you dealing with social media, how can you extract the things that are sort of interesting parts of the conversation that are useful and to take out some of the more toxic sort of, and maybe this is a more recent, you know, Twitter for me has sort of become a really toxic space. Um, and I'm wondering how you dealt with that at the time and if that's sort of, if that's evolved uh, since you guys started. Yeah, I think you're right about it being more recent. Um, it's, at least in my case, in the, in the early days, people were still discovering it in using it for news. And so mm-hmm. when the stream started, you still had people, some of our, you know, higher management in Doha who were like, what is this show? They would laugh about it. They dismissed it because it seemed like a kid show. And they didn't think that it had a place on Al Jazeera. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a kid show because it was using social media. And we had on people who you didn't necessarily see on TV otherwise. You had on young, a lot of young people. You had activists. You had people who were actually the ones moving these protests along wherever they were. And so, of course, in the beginning, it was the Arab Spring. To bring this back to social media, in the beginning days, it really was a place of uh, camaraderie and um, there wasn't this sense of toxicity. But on the other hand, there was a sense that some people very quickly saw that they could get famous and they could get their point across if they put it on Twitter. And so then it became this kind of mad dash for journalists to figure out what's right, what, what are we supposed to be amplifying, what are we not supposed to be. And especially in protests when you're not actually there. And in some of these places, they were breaking out so fast that we didn't already have people like in Algeria. We didn't already have someone. It's figuring out, is this video that someone's posting really from this place they say that they're posting? Is it not? And so figuring out how to do journalism was rapidly shifting at that time. I think now we've, we've figured it out, you know, how to verify, how to fact check. But in the beginning days, it was just, it was really kind of a no man's land. That's super interesting. I mean, I think that even even feels like something that we're dealing with now in a different way, where what is the role of a journalist in a landscape where there's so much purposeful misinformation yeah. um, and, you know, sorting through that and knowing what you're giving airtime to and how you sort of deal with that. How do you think about that in the kind of contemporary uh, context of what's going on in the world? Um, I'm lucky because the stream shaped me to think about the world in a different way. And, and, and probably Al Jazeera as a whole shaped me to think about the world in a different way. And so my main goal as a journalist now, after I joined in, okay, so a really long time, I joined, I joined Al Jazeera <laughs> in 2009, um, is I am more concerned with getting voices who do not necessarily always have the microphone. So I want people who you have not heard from. I want people who are actually affected by the story so often. And we, we see it today still all the time. You'll have news reporters talk about a story with these like talking heads or people in think tanks, Brookings or, you know, uh, analysts who, who work at these like ivory tower organizations, but not the actual people that are affected. Mm-hmm. So for me, journalism is all about hearing from the people that are either affected by a policy or, you know, by a plan, um, or the people who are actually doing the work to make change. That's, that's really interesting. I mean, I think we've talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious. I want to talk a little bit about the take, but maybe this is the right time to talk about something else that I wanted to ask you is how, you know, you've spent most of your career being, working at a news organization that's based in the Middle East. I think 
I don't know how you would kind of describe Al Jazeera's focus. Um, it's a very international focus, especially Al Jazeera English, but it's still, you know, there's still a heavy kind of Middle East component to it. Um, and now you're back in the United States in your own country dealing, you know, you're one of the people who is dealing with what's happening around you, what the policies are that are affecting you. How, how does that affect you as a journalist when you're reporting on things that are so close to home? And how has that sort of fit into your career of going really far away and coming back closer to home? Um, so uh, when this round of protests against police violence kicked off, this latest round, so right after the healing of George Floyd, um, I went to D.C. So I, I went to the White House in D.C. It's literally like nine minutes, 13 minutes away from my house. Mm -hmm. um, and my plan was just to drive by just to see what was happening because this is before anything had really gotten really big. It was just that people, people were out in the streets and they were making their voices heard. And so I wanted to see it. I wanted to document it. I didn't, I didn't know if there was another way that I could be a part of it because as a journalist, I do try my best to always remember what hat I'm wearing. And so while it's totally okay for a journalist to go out and protest or to, you know, wave signs with their political beliefs, um, I tend not to. I prefer to, because I have the privilege of being a journalist, I prefer to always wear that hat. So if I'm going to a protest, um, you won't see me chanting slogans, um, but you will see me interviewing people who are chanting slogans because I want the world to know what they think. And of course, I have my own personal beliefs as well. I definitely believe Black Lives Matter and, you know, justice for all. Um, but I want, I think it's more important to hear from the people who don't have a microphone like I have. So my plan was to drive by just to see, maybe chat to a few people and then we're there for maybe 10, 15 minutes, me and my husband, and I had convinced another friend, another journalist friend to come along. Mm -hmm. And that is when we were pepper sprayed. Um, and then the tear gas came out. And so in hindsight, um, I thought about this differently than I thought about it that day. That day, you know, I got on Instagram because that's what I do. So right away I got on Instagram and I'm documenting it and my tears are running and there's snot and it's gross and whatever. Um, and I said something to the effect of, you know, I've, I've only had this happen to me in Egypt when I was covering the revolution. I have never had this happen to me in my own country. And while that's true, factually, I have never had that happen to me. Um, I edited it when I reposted, like I, I downloaded the video and then I snipped that part out and reposted it because I, I don't ever want to give the impression that I think the U.S. is exceptional and that things like this could never happen in the U.S. Because mm -hmm. as we know from the very founding of our country, things like this have happened. Um, it's just as the years have gone on, they've been more and more um, covered up and they're more and more subtle and subliminal. And so it's very, very rare that they're this blatant, that people are exercising their right to protest in front of the White House and, you know, police are stopping them. So very blatantly in front of cameras, that is a thing that I've seen more in my coverage of other countries. But of course, it's not a thing that's un-American. It is a thing that is very American. It is a thing that is very integral to who we are as a country that's founded on um, the decimation of entire communities, Native American communities, and then the decimation of Black life um, and enslaved Africans. So that context, I think, is really important for people to have and for me to also to remember that um, yeah, this happens in the Middle East, but it also happens right here. And then it reminded me, actually, last thing I'll say on this, I was doing a story with the ultras. Um, and so they are, if you don't know them in Egypt, they are, some would call them football hooligans, but, you know, they're really, really passionate about football, soccer. Um, and they were, they played a really big role post-revolution and being out in the streets and organizing people. And I was following them, I was shadowing them for several days during the protests right after the first parliamentary elections that then descended into chaos. And we would get hit by pepper spray and tear gas, and then they would run up to me afterwards, and they would show me the canisters of the, like the spent tear gas canisters. And they would all mm -hmm. say, made in the USA, product of the USA. And it's just mind boggling because your average American probably doesn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you're in such a, you have such an interesting vantage point because I think, like you said, most people in the, in the United States probably don't have a clear sense of 
how quickly things can um, devolve and how much is under the surface that's sort of being covered up. And that's something that I think, you know, we think about a lot in that Victor community as far as like, who's, where, are the, where is the information that we've received our whole lives coming from? How can we ask our own questions? And it sounds like a lot of like what you've thought about throughout your career, not just in this present moment, has been about the people who listening to voices of people who are actually affected, not people who have made a living on kind of telling those stories. Um, and there's like so much work to do there, it seems to me. Like that's part, that is the work, is like kind of like retelling, untelling. Um, so it's really interesting to hear, to hear how that's fit into to your career. I want to talk a little bit about um, the take, which is your newest venture um, on Al Jazeera. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. I, you know, on this slide, you guys can see a few of the episodes and we'll send the link out to the take for people to listen to. I, I mean, I've been listening to the take since you started it. Oh, um, you. This Yemen episode, I found extremely moving and difficult mm -hmm. to listen to. And this ep episode from this past weekend, America's Other Independence Day. I mean, what I really love about this format and I'd love to hear your thoughts on how it's different than the stream um, is you're just talking to you. We're really hearing stories from the perspective of somebody in situ who thinks and deals with this thing the whole time. And like, and in similar to the stream, it's still kind of contempt. It's like this week's events, right. Um, in, in half an hour. So yeah, tell us how this take came about and what your vision is for this podcast. Um, so thank you for listening. Every listener helps. Um, we, the idea was Al Jazeera wanted to get into the podcast market um, because everyone and their mother is in the podcast market. So they're like, why not? We, we want to rival the, the New York Times, which has the Daily and the Washington Post has one, the Wall Street Journal. So all these, you know, big American news organizations have one. Um, and so it is our answer to that. Uh, of course, we are a network that is primarily video. And so our audiences know us for video. So it mm -hmm. has been a little bit of, there's like a learning curve that we have to do. We have to one, find new audiences and mm -hmm. two, teach the audiences that really want to see us on video. And I still get tweets all the time. They're like, this is so great. I can't wait to see this episode. What time does it air in Nairobi? <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, best part about it. You can listen to it anytime. Right. <laughs> um, so there's a slight learning curve there, but I like it because one, it gives me, I was looking for flexibility that TV can't give me. Of course, now we're all working from home, but with the take, with, with a podcast format, I could do it from wherever, as long as I have a nice mic. Um, so the flexibility and also the challenge in telling a story without pictures, which is really hard. And so I wanted to kind of challenge my brain to figure out how to do that, how to still get a point across um, and in this new format, in this new medium. Um, and so, yes, we, we take a slice of life. The Yemen one was really difficult to listen to because um, our guest, um, it, one, just the situation in Yemen is just so heartbreaking. And two, I got lots of messages after that one. And if anyone has listened to it, you'll know why. It's the guest, um, he was pacing during the interview. He was walking around. He was just really nervous because you yeah. never know when an airstrike is going to hit. Um, but also we got messages from people that were like, he sounds sick and he sounds like winded and out of breath. Can you check on him? And we did and he's fine, but he also knows a staggering amount of people who have died of the coronavirus, like more people than I've, I, I knew was possible or, or than I've heard of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because the situation is so bad there. So it has been eye-opening in getting to learn new stories. Um, and it's also been just really rewarding. Who, who, do you, who is the kind of target audience for you? Is it a U.S. audience? Is it a global audience? Is it an audience in the Middle East? I know Al Jazeera Arabic and English kind of have different audiences, but I'm curious to, to hear how you're thinking about it for the take specifically. Um, so the majority audience for Al Jazeera English as a whole is, well, let me rephrase that. The, our, our biggest audience is people in the U.S., North America. And that's because they want news that is told in a different way. And it's also mm -hmm. because they want to know what's going on in the Middle East. And so our coverage skyrocketed, of course, during the Arab upri uprisings, 2011. And then it also really skyrocketed um, right around the time of the assassination of Soleimani. And then it skyrocketed again. We've seen numbers like we haven't seen before um, with coronavirus for whatever reason. I guess it's because we're covering it well. I don't know. But also we're mm -hmm. covering it. Um, more globally than your average place would be covering it. So we're telling you what's happening in Iran, what's happening in Belgium, Yemen, all of that. 
Mm-hmm. So a um, big part of our audience comes from the U.S. because they're missing that kind of coverage. And so for the take, we keep that in mind, um, but then also want to make sure that we are satisfying people who are all over the world. So we have, we've seen the map of where our listeners come from. Some are in the Philippines, some are in London, Australia, New Zealand, um, a few in Southeast Asia, Asia. So it's kind of a, it's a smattering. And so we're trying to make all those same, all those people happy, um, but also covering it in a way that is still very Al Jazeera. That's incredible. I mean, Malika, I, you know, it's so exciting to hear you and to watch you throughout your career, because I feel like you're always on the cutting edge of what's, of what's relevant and happening, not just as, as far as like topics, but also format. I mean, the format of the stream was really innovative at the time and still remains really innovative. Um, and I think just the space that you're kind of talking about focusing on audiences that are not necessarily US based when that is really where all of the money behind media is in the UK or the US. Um, it's really something fresh and interesting. And I've always, I've always felt like that's like a niche that Al Jazeera English did really well, but specifically in your shows, um, it's pretty remarkable. So Thank you. everybody, please go check out these take episodes. Um, We are going to switch now to a quick round of more fun questions, uh, a quick fire Q&A. So part of the conversation series, you know, we want to hear about uh, people's careers and their sort of professional lives, but uh, we also want to get to know you a little bit more on a personal level. So there's four little questions, uh, starting with uh, this one. What are you uh, reading or watching right now? Okay, so quick fire, watching any mind-numbing thing that you can think of because uh, since my job is the hard news and sad and devastating, my goal when I am done with work is to watch stuff that is not so um, dumb things. That That's what, what I'm watching. <laughs> and, and reading, I actually, it's here. Um, this is a gift that I got after graduation from college, um, mm-hmm. A People's History of the United States. And, you know, it's a very woke thing to read this because it's an alternative version of, alternative, but like a factual version of the things that we aren't taught in, in schools here in the U.S. and around the world. Um, but I also will have to admit that I never finished it. And so now felt like a really good time to come back and to start rereading it, starting with Columbus um, and his, you know, genocidal tendencies as he <laughs> discovered the new world. So that, that's what I'm reading. I feel, like you're, I feel like you're kind of like reflecting the two things that people are doing right now, like trying to escape and also trying really hard to engage. <laughs> it's, like, it's really hard. <laughs> it is really hard. I mean, that's something, I, if we have time in the q and I'll come back to sort of your self-care tips for people. <laughs> um, so your second question, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Um, I would have to say Michelle Obama. Not during quarantine, because I think our lives are all really boring in quarantine, and I don't care what she's doing in her house right now. (laughs) But pre-quarantine, I would have loved to know what she was really thinking during her husband's presidency, what it was really like to be the first Black first lady, because she was so decorum, like she's so poised and public, and you just know that she had lots of actual thoughts behind this facade she had to put up for America's sake. So that, and also her workout regimen, because I I used to, my apartment used to be next door to a solid core gym, which is this hardcore gym in the US. And every morning um, her black SUV would pull up and her bodyguards, the secret service would be outside as she went inside to work out. And then I would be getting a croissant at Le Pan, um, the bakery next door. So I was not working out, but I would love to shadow her and see what that was like. (laughs) <laughs> That's great, Malika. Malika, it's funny because I, you know, a lot of people I, that knew that you were coming on the show also mentioned me saying like, oh, I love Malika. And some of what they love about you is what you're describing about Michelle Obama being so poised and sort of <laughs> being so diplomatic. And I think like that's one of the things that I've noticed you, when you're, you know, it's maybe it's part of the format of what you're doing, but when you're sort of sitting between in a conversation between Uh, different perspectives on something. I think it's a really hard line to sort of do that in a forceful and effective way, but also not like show your cards and sort of be able to facilitate the discussion. Um, And that's something you do so well. And I'm wondering, do you have any, like, what, what is, where does that come from? Is that just, that's, I, I got to tell you, I don't know that it's true because I was often told by my executive producer at the stream that 
I need it to work on my face <laughs> because I don't, I don't have a poker face. So if there was a guest saying some really crazy stuff, um, or if I was annoyed at uh, anyone, my co-host, uh, it would sometimes show. So mm -hmm. that's the thing I actually have to work on. I don't know that I have a voice. <laughs> All right. Third question. Uh, I know we have lots of people who want to ask questions. So let's get through these last two. Uh, what do people most understand about your, misunderstand about your work? Um, I think they think that ha making conversations is easy. Um, so even for this conversation we're having today, Yazin and I are friends, but still we didn't, he didn't know all the stuff about me. So we had a long conversation about what should we talk about and where should we go and what are things we should bring up? And so it's the same with journalism, like good conversations don't just happen. They take mm -hmm. hours of research and figuring out the best way to ask a question so that you'll get the juiciest response. So yeah. Mikey, uh, Mikey, write that down. That's a good for us. to add that to our, <laughs> our list. <laughs> All right. Your last question is, whose work do you admire and are inspired by? Um, I would say probably Nicole Hannah-Jones. She's with the New York Times Magazine. She's the creator of the 1619 Project, which was mm -hmm. um, marking the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved Africans to make it to these shores. Um, and just the way her mind works and the ability for her to take in all of this history and disseminate it in a way that is now all for all of us to learn about in a way we may not have ever learned if it was just in a history book, which it wasn't in, in a history book that we had read anyway. So um, I admire her for doing that. Great. And that's, yeah, that's an amazing show to listen to and read as well. Okay, so we're going to move into our Q&A time now. Uh, Mikey has been keeping track of questions. So if you would just, when we call on you, if you would just um, unmute your microphone um, and ask your question to Malika. If you want to turn on your camera, please feel free to do that too. The first question is from Karen. Hi, Malika. Um, Hi, Karen. I was wondering um, what are the tools you use to verify the stories on social media? You mentioned something about tools. Um, yes. So they've changed. They vary over the years because a lot of them are free. And so one will pop up and then kind of disappear. Um, Google Trends and Google, like Google has a whole suite of things and you can Google it, um, but I can also send you a list because I can't remember their names at the top of my head, but they have a way to verify images. So if you see an image that's on Twitter and someone is saying, oh, it's from a protest in Yemen, and then you can... Um, check out the data behind that photo and it'll tell you a lot and help you hone in on whether or not this photo is actually from Yemen. And oftentimes it's not, it's from, you know, something years ago in a whole totally different country. So that helps a lot. Um, there are also some things that you do need logins for. And again, I can give you a list of them, but there are things to help you figure out, um, there's one tool called CrowdTangle, which is nice. And there's a free version of that. And so you can use it to see where um, traffic is coming from for a website or for a tweet. And so you can see who, where that tweet first originated because sometimes that you know, gets lost in the shuffle and the originator is, is left off of it. So um, I can send you a list, but yeah, those are just a couple. Um, our next question is from Ahmed. Hi, Malika. Uh, Hi. First of all, uh, thank you for such an incredible, um, for your time and just giving us a look at your um, journey. Um, my question is, um, I know in the take and in your work in general, you probably report on a lot of things that are great and a lot of things that, you know, are maybe incredibly disheartening and hard to deal with. And so um, I think you alluded to this earlier, but I'm wondering what are some of those ways in which you practice self-care as a journalist? And if I may add an extension, uh, what are some strategies and tips that you have come to practice with your guests who um, have undergone a lot of trauma sometimes in their experiences? And sort of how do you approach that um, conversation in a way that is comfortable and, um, and careful? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I'll, I'll pick up on the second part first because we just had this discussion. Um, we have in an upcoming episode, but I already did the interview, we have on someone who was incarcerated for a short while and was pregnant while she was in prison. And just this really deep story. And then her husband was uh, sent away to jail for attempted murder and she doesn't believe he did it. 
And it's just huge, huge things to like, you know, we're on Zoom in a, in a, you know, 45 minute chat and you're like, wow, okay, I need to move on to the next topic, but I can't dismiss this person's pain of what they told me. So a big help in figuring that out is making sure that you chat before the actual interview um, with, with that guest and what is the best way for me to bring up this sensitive topic and what's off limits and what's not off limits. And then once you're in the conversation, it makes it a lot easier because you already know what's, what's a safe zone and what's not. And then if you don't have time to do that chat beforehand, something that we often do is just um, these verbal signposts, they're called. So if it's me and you, Ahmed, I might say something like, so Ahmed, I want to bring up a sensitive topic and it deals with your father. Are you okay with me going there? So it's just like you've given these little breadcrumbs that you're about to ask something that's like really personal and probably no one's business, but you know, you're a journalist and you have to. Um, and then for the first part, um, for me, it's just making sure I'm not good at this, um, but turning off Twitter when I need a mental break. So sometimes it's just too much and you just find yourself like your blood pressure is just raising, 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 whether it's Corona, whether it's like racial injustice. And so closing social media, putting my phone away and then like going to turn on HGTV, the, the, the house, house hunting show channel here in the US, that that's my self-care. Uh, Yusuf? Um, thank Hi, Yusuf. you for the time. It's been quite insightful. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first was, if you do deal with trolls, how do you deal with that personally? Because I think Al Jazeera might deal with them through community managers. So how would you deal with that on a personal level? Um, and what advice would you give for people who are journalists or presenters on dealing with uh, trolling issues? Um, my second question was, do you use any kind of tools to measure success on your podcast? And do these tools uh, influence future topics of discussion? Um, okay, so first question. I've been really fortunate that I haven't faced that many trolls. And I think it's because um, I'm almost speaking to the choir for a lot of what we do at Al Jazeera. So the people that follow us want our content. They already know which, what, what perspective and lens they're kind of going to get. Um, and so occasionally, if I'll do a story about some Trump administration policy or something like immigration, that's when the trolls will come out. And they're people who aren't our regular like viewers or audience members. They're people who saw something on Twitter and then want to come join in. Um, and in those instances, um, it's I love blocking and muting. It's just it's just like it's it's a, it's a life set. It's just block and mute. Um, and occasionally, when it gets a little bit scarier than that, um, I'll report it to Twitter. Um, which she really doesn't really do all that much. It doesn't mean that much, but at least it makes me feel like, okay, I did something. I have a little bit of power. Um, and then the second part of your question, our bosses, the ones that are in Doha, audio is new for them too. And so they're used to seeing metrics that you would get for television, this many hits, and you don't get that for audio. And audio is also really difficult to share online. So right now our metrics are one thing. We look at um, downloads, how many downloads from Apple devices, Google devices, and website. Um, and we're trying to grow that number. But even that is just so... It doesn't tell you, well, maybe they clicked and they, they listened on this thing, but it didn't actually download or, you know, there, it's, it's an inexact science. And I think that's true for most people in podcasting. So we're kind of finding our way. Uh, okay. So we have one last question from um, Anna Maria. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I'm curious to know if you know what the next story you really want to tell is. Given everything you're reading, everything you're watching, there's a lot of content, but if you, if you have an idea of the next um, dream project and dream story, would you share that with us? Um, I would share it, but I don't have one because so for so long, so the stream was a daily show and this is a three times a week show. And it just doesn't leave a lot of time for even thinking about like bigger picture, which is, we all agree, even on both teams, we're all like, this is wrong. We really need a big picture kind of like a planner. But when you just go from story to story, it's really difficult to kind of figure out, oh, what would I really like to be doing um, on a longer scale? So for me, the best source of inspiration for stuff like that is asking other people, especially on Twitter. So if you have a story that you really want us to cover, please do share it because 
then that would be that story. I mean, in recent, in sort of the recent, the past couple of weeks, what has been the episode that you would like to direct people to that has meant a lot to you? Um, several of them have been really good. There's two that come to mind. One is um, the cruise ship uh, episode because uh, because of coronavirus, lots of cruise ships, because the cruise industry is really big here in the U.S. and in other countries as well. Egypt is another one of them. Um, you know, people were stranded for a long time. They were finally let off. But the people that are still on the ships are the cruise uh, the actual crews of the crews, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and these are people who are not privileged, you know, these are not people who'd be able to afford cruise lines anyway, they're the, the staff and they're stuck there. Many of them have to pay the prices that you would pay if you were a tourist on the ship to, because of food or making long distance calls to their family. So we talked to someone who, his family is in um, Mauritius, another uh, was uh, in another country in Africa. They're scattered and they're away from their families and they literally have no word on when they're going to be allowed to leave the cruise and come back home because their countries aren't allowing them to dock and come home. So wow. that was a good one. And then the, the one we just did um, a few days ago on Independence Day was, you know, personal because Independence Day is we weren't all really free here in the U.S. So it's a rethinking of that date. Yeah, I found that. I Please go check out that episode in particular. I think that it's, it's funny that you don't, you know, we've, we're hearing so much um, information from so many different places and it's kind of like overwhelming a lot of people. And I found that 30 minutes really kind of calming in a way because it's just so clear. Uh, the thinking is so clear. The storytelling is so clear um, and just like left me with sort of what, what you actually need to know about the whole Thank thing. You. So. Do we have time um, for um, yes. Hamro? <laughs> if possible, one more. If not, it's all good. Amro, did you send your question already? Can you type it in the chat? Or I just wanted to ask what were some of the ways your perception of the world changed after you know moving to the Gulf or Egypt or Arabia in general? Mm. And and does uh, Al Jazeera promote anything other than you know deep topics or involving going through trauma? Like does art or any other performative art make its way to you guys? Okay, excellent questions. Number two, we often joke that even if there's an art or light angle, Al Jazeera will find the way to <laughs> find the destruction and the tragedy in it. So uh, it's a failing, um, but we do sometimes do lighter topics. They're just, it's very far and few between. So if you ever have a lighter topic, don't <laughs> shy away from letting me know about it because there's, there's at least one platform that will do it. Um, and then the first part of the question, um, no, because I grew up going to an all Palestinian school my entire life. So first through 12th grade, it's majority Palestinian. There were some other people. There was like one Bosnian, four black kids, and, you know, maybe a couple Syrians, but majority Palestinian. So I was raised in the Arab world, even though I was in uh, Chicago. And so it was a culture that I'm really familiar with. And then going to the Middle East just reconfirmed what I already knew. <laughs> so knew, loved, and hated. So yeah. <laughs> Malika, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a fantastic conversation. Everybody, thank you for joining us on this episode and all of the others you've been joining us on. Uh, please continue to participate, ask questions, and uh, stay curious, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.